Hey there ladies and gentlemen and welcome back. I'm your host Pat Sun and today we're gonna be taking a look at r slash infidelity where for some weird reason OP still hasn't learned his lesson. Let's begin. A lawyer's pro revenge on a wife beater posted by reddit user called in the 90s. Let's call him Joe. I have to call him something. The man I ruined but I can't call him by his real name so let's call him Joe. Joe was a wife beater. I was hired by Joe's brother-in-law, the brother of the wife that Joe beat. My client was also Joe's ex-business partner. Aside from the whole you beat up my sister thing, my client had another beef with Joe, a serious business beef. My client took it to court and gave me the case to handle. Joe and his lawyers fought me long and hard. Joe was confident that his bullshit and outright perjury would carry the day. It had always worked before. His bullshit and his fists had won him a good settlement with his ex-wife, free of child support, so maybe he thought that threats and lies would carry the day once more. But he was wrong, and after the trial I had a judgment against him, a big judgment, far bigger than he could pay. Joe twisted and he turned and he shimmed and shaked, but after a while I'd located and taken all his assets. It was easy really, Joe had no thought of consequences, and so he didn't lawyer up until it was too late. If one of my clients ever sues you, you're in trouble, because my clients lawyer up before they even know your name. But Joe didn't lawyer up until the process server threw the papers at his feet, and by then, it was far too late. I went through Joe's assets like a meat grinder, and after a while Joe had but one property left, a house, and he clung to that house for it was rented out, and his sole source of income. Joe lived in the unfinished basement and he survived on what the upstairs tenants paid him. He cashed their rent checks at payday loan places, paying hefty fees, but it was worth it, because he knew that I'd garnish any bank account that he opened. Joe managed to hide his rental place from me for a while because he owned it through a numbered company, but my investigator found him one day and followed him home. Joe self-repped his way through the next stage, which took a couple of years, while I punctured his corporate veils and his sad efforts at a fraudulent conveyance. But in the end, I had his last house, the house where he lived in the unfinished basement. Joe stepped out one day to get a pack of cigarettes and when he came back, the sheriff had changed the locks. Can my client at least live in the basement? Joe's lawyer said to me, pro bono, because by this point Joe had nothing to pay lawyers. I knew the pro bono guy, he practiced law nearby. As I was talking to him, I could see pro bono guy's office window across the parking lot from my office tower window. Ask the purchaser I said, it's out of my hands, and it was. I told Joe's lawyer that the new owner, a nominee, one of my client's employees wouldn't let him back into his shitty basement apartment. Joe, a man who had owned this and that here and there and all over town had just lost the last thing he owned on earth. Except for his truck. He still had his truck left. Joe's truck was this big ass gas guzzling beast that he drove around in. It was too old and too frail to be worth seizing, so I let Joe keep it and I was glad I did that, because now the truck was where Joe slept, until he made a mistake and lost his truck too. He lost his truck the day I got a phone call from the tenants at the house that Joe used to own. He came back and parked his truck across the driveway, the tenant said, adding that Joe had gone nuts. He'd parked his truck there in a rage, out of spite, and then walked into town, saying he'd be back later that day to sleep in his truck. Can you get around the truck? I asked, the tenant could not. The driveway was blocked. I called one of the tow truck guys that I used to defend back in my criminal lawyer days, and in a couple of hours that truck was gone and parked somewhere else, somewhere special, in accordance with my specific instructions. My guy wants his truck back, the pro bono lawyer said the next day when he called me. Not happening, I said. I stood in my office 15 floors above the parking lot and looked down where I imagined my pro bono counterpart was standing in his office, facing the same lot. But you have no right to the truck, he said. He has no right to block a man's driveway, I replied. It was terrible, really, standing up high, pronouncing words that took away a man's final asset, the last thing he owned on earth. I imagine that this must be what God feels like before he strips a man of everything and sends him to hell. Are you really gonna make me go to court over this? Said pro bono guy. Do what you gotta do, I said, and pro bono guy said his client was coming in the next day to sign an affidavit, and then they were going to court to get the truck back. But I was unconcerned. The next day was bright, and the sun was shining and it was 9 in the morning as I looked out the window and sipped my coffee. My phone rang, I picked up, it was pro bono man. Why didn't you tell me that Joe's truck was parked right outside my office? His voice was tight, and I could tell that he must have been shaking with anger. Is that so? I said, staring out at Joe's truck parked 15 stories below me. 
How careless of my bailiff to leave the truck where your client could easily take it back. I really must speak to him. Very funny. My client's going to sue. No he isn't. He's going to get in that truck and drive away right now. I told my tow guy to fill up the tank and he gave it an oil change too, gratis. Tell your client to get in his truck and drive off and that if I ever see that truck again, I'll seize it to satisfy the rest of my client's judgment. Pro bono guy tried to argue, but I was firm. Then I put the phone down and picked up my coffee. A few minutes later Joe walked out of his lawyer's office and over to his truck. As he walked, I saw that there was no longer a bounce to his step. The joy had gone out of him. Joe wasn't the first guy I ruined and he won't be the last. But he is the only one whose final ruin I witnessed from on high, from my office, and it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. Watching a man walk to his truck, knowing that I had stripped him of everything else he had, and that he owed his possession of his last asset, his truck, to my mercy. Joe drove away, his big-ass ancient truck spilling clouds of smoke from the exhaust. I was pretty sure I'd never hear from him again, and I never did. Am I the only one who thinks this is fiction? The whole story reads like a fever dream and a fantasy, decently structured but weirdly descriptive of emotions, and very much reads like revenge porn to me. It kinda feels like OP is stroking his imaginary ego, imagining he's this weird savior that will punish all the wrongdoers. But anyways, good creative writing OP. And now for today's second story. 15 years, then things went south. Posted by Reddit user Legis. I will start by saying that we are still together. Eight years ago I caught my wife having an affair, correction affairs. I had no idea we were having problems and it still messes with me to this day. My wife and I were young when we met, I was 22 and she was 17 almost 18. She actually lied and told me she was 17 because she knew I would not date her if she was younger. We lived together from day one of officially dating and was married six years later. By the end of this, you are going to be crying. Like a little bitch. Four years after we were married we had our first child. She was a miracle, my wife had an ovarian cyst and I had lower sperm counts. Two and a half years later we have our second daughter, at this time I was working long hours for a tech company. My wife had complications with our second daughter and almost died. After that I changed jobs to a partially work from home job with great benefits. She went back to work part time and things seemed good, but weren't. I was playing a prank on her by changing a few things on her phone. And that's when I saw she had another email address. In that box I saw she was receiving messages from random men and updates from Ashley Madison, whose tagline was life short, have an affair. I was in disbelief, so I tried to gather myself but the next day I confronted her. She immediately went to saying it was my fault she was on that site and it was only for attention, and that she had never met up with anyone, but she lied. We'll add part 2 tomorrow. Thank you for listening or reading. And now for OP's first update. So I after I confronted my wife, I looked up her ad or profile on Ashley Madison, and it said all sorts of things like wanting to be a constant meetup. Person needs a love nest all sorts of things to describe what she wants and also noted that she wasn't looking to change her marital status. The one that hurt most was father figure, made me wonder if she was looking to have one of these ass hats around my children. I looked in the inbox and saw several people she had been talking with, one of them she even told where she was taking our kids for the afternoon. This was a family outing. I confronted her about that and told her that she was putting herself and our children in danger and she didn't know these people so why would you tell them where you would be? She said I was overreacting and that it was fine because she didn't ask them to join. I was taken aback. For one I was there and if some random guy had come up to her I probably would have beaten the hell out of him. I noticed on her Ashley Madison profile she noted she was on a program called Kick, so I downloaded the app and was able to guess her password. Soon messages began to come in one asking so I guess we weren't meeting last night. Previously to being caught my wife was supposedly having dinner with her friend. So I sent a screenshot to the wife and she cussed me out saying now this is in her inbox and swore up and down that she had never met up with anyone. We'll continue more tomorrow. And now for OP's second update. So after she scolded me for texting her an image of someone saying they were supposed to meet up, she accused me of emotionally cheating on here because I had a female friend that I discussed movies with. I had a gut feeling that I wasn't being told the truth, so I did a backup of her phone and then started sorting the history and data. 
First, I found a Craigslist ad she posted in Missed Connections, where she was telling an officer that she apparently flirted with while taking our kids to a park, that she would really like to get to know him better. I confronted her on this and she said she just forgot that she posted this. I asked her if there were any more ads or anything else I would find, and she said no. A few days went by and I found another post that was posted from a different email account and this one was directed at a guy she saw at the gym. I confronted her again, and again she forgot that she posted it. This time I was even more furious and asked again if she met up with anyone or anything else in which she swore up and down she didn't. The next week was a trip for a course I was taking, and the family was coming along. Things seemed okay. When we got home I wasn't feeling well and the next day I ended up in the hospital in quarantine because they didn't know what was going on with me. The doctor asked me if I had been with a prostitute, I was embarrassed and taken back. Again, I told the wife she needs to be honest and let me know if she had met up with anyone. Still no, no, no I got out four days later after a ton of antibiotics and still no honesty out of the wife. We'll try to add more tomorrow. And now, for OP's final update. Sorry for the delay. So after I got out of the hospital, I worked twice as hard to decipher the hidden data in the backup I had of her phone. Finally I found some hard evidence. I found deleted messages of places and times she was meeting guys, ping locations from her being there, scrubbed the kick database and was able to see how many people she chatted with. So I saved all this data and showed it to her after our kids were in bed. At this point she started to tell me how many people she met up with and things she did. She met them at our spot amongst other places, the guys were more or less 10 years my age. I know I should have left, but I wasn't thinking clearly and I was worried about my kids. So I ended up getting rid of the car that she did these things and at a loss, was too painful to see it in the driveway and see my kids sitting where she did these things. She didn't feel responsible for that at all, because it didn't bother her, I moved us 15 oh miles away and tried to start over. Here I am nearly 8 years later, I still don't trust her, I am going to a therapist, and I spend a bit of time wondering if I would be healthier mentally if I had divorced her then. Wow, like a bitch. And that's what Frieza said. OP, you should have kicked the cheating hoe the first time, but instead, you continued to waste even more time and resources. Why are you still here? Now you're wondering why you're so fucked up in the head. Well, instead of explaining this myself, I want you to listen to this comment by Reddit user Ozzycop. You have done and continue to do Sisyphean labor. 1. Neither in life, nor on the internet, including on Reddit subs, I have not met cases of true reconciliation in the realm of feelings, love, respect, friendship, purity of relationships, either in the short or long term. Trust was restored in the best case I've ever met, by no more than 98% 20 years after D-Day. I also have not met cases in which the victim of cheating would forget the affair, and the affair partner would put up with them. That's what one serious scientific study claims. Reconciliation fails in 80% attempts within 5 years of D-Day. Of the less than 20% that get beyond 5 years, another half will divorce before the 10-year mark. Infidelity and behavioral couple therapy, relationship outcomes over 5 years following therapy 2014. 2. I also met several posts and comments in which victims of cheating 20, 30, 35 years after the beginning of the reconciliation claim that if it were possible to turn back the clock, they would undoubtedly leave the cheaters no matter what. 3. From time to time, there are also posts in which victims of cheating brag that after spending several years or decades with cheaters, they are happy. However, it follows from their posts that they never forgot anything, that they had more or less strong anxieties about the fidelity of cheaters, that the feelings they had experienced in their relationships with cheaters before the affair never returned to them. In addition, the question arises of their constant participation in subs dedicated to infidelity throughout the infinite period of their reconciliation. If everything is so good, then why do they continue to stay in these specific communities? In addition, these lucky ones of course do not know what the cheaters themselves truly think about the happy reconciliation. Because cheaters, of course, pour into the ears of their victims what they want to hear because of their selfish interests. 4. I have seen examples on the internet of a true successful reunion of former partners after cheating, but only after a complete breakup of the relationship, divorce and after many years, five or more years of independent life without mutual obligation. In all cases, they were essentially a new relationship from scratch.
Viewer support is the best way for me to remain independent and continue bringing you these daily videos, which will always be here on my channels for you to watch absolutely free. So please consider subscribing to me on Rumble and on YouTube. Both will be linked in the description box down below. Thanks for listening everyone. If you even somewhat enjoyed today's story, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, and if you really like it, consider subscribing to Pat's Hunt to never miss a future upload. Stay strong.